Hi guys, welcome to Learn Electronics Repair. I have a motherboard here that was actually sent to me by a subscriber. This is from Robert in the UK. And he is obviously really into his retro gaming because this is an old MSI motherboard with an AMD processor on it. He sent me the CPU with it as well. And he says that he recapped the motherboard but now he thinks he has a short circuit on it and he asked me if I would have a look. He also sent with it, I'm not quite sure why, but he did, he sent the uh, cables. Oh, I see. So he's been using this with an adapter from ATX to AT. Okay. The cables, I have plenty of cables. I don't really need to use them. And then here, actually he sent me the hard drive so this is a 160 gig hard drive ide so yeah thanks robert for sending this in something interesting let's see what we can do with it so oh yeah you say you've done a good job of recapping this because it's quite tidy but i can see that a capacitor's room be placed here, one here, maybe some more. Let's zoom down a little bit. Okay, so I can see that the capacitors here have been replaced. And here, these are probably all on the vehicle. Let's have a quick look. Yeah, that's these ones and these ones. Um, I'm guessing he's used the same sort, but they could be different. Let's see what else we have. So we have uh, another one here. Um, looks like that one, unless it's just been soldered. Same with that one and this one. So first thing I have to say, Rob, you've done a good job of it. I mean, that's you know pretty decent work, to be quite honest. Let's have a look for this short that you can see. I'll just use continuity mode. So we get a bleep. Let's see. So these are the capacitors on here and that reads about 9 ohms but if this is V core you would expect to read the the resistance of the CPU which is probably something like that so we'll have to take the CPU out to check that there's some more up here we can have a look well those read higher so this is definitely a different phase Okay, we can have a look at the ones down here, the small ones, I can see where you've worked on them, but you've done a good job of it I will say for sure. Okay, there's some over here, that reads okay. Another one up here, probably on the memory phase maybe reads okay so i don't see any shorts here what i can see is this low resistance on v core okay about nine ohms but i don't think that's a short i think what i'm seeing there is actually the resistance of the cpu i'll remove the cpu then we can check again there is our cpu it's an athlon let's see which one it is in fact Yeah, this is the 2400 plus. So we'll take the CPU out. Okay. Now let's check that short again. Okay. Here we are across the capacitors. I think this is the ground end. And it's climbing up. It still is a bit low, but I'm not rightly sure that is actually a short. I think what we need to do is to put the CPU in and power this up. I mean, bear in mind this voltage rail will be a low voltage, so a relatively low resistance wouldn't pass a huge amount of current. With the CPU back in place, I'm now seeing a resistance here 
of about nine ohms again. Yeah, nine ohms. So that's definitely the CPU that we can read the resistance of. Let's power this up. I've connected my known good power supply. We will check for any shorts on the 12 volts. No, that's reading fine. And while I'm here, I'll just check the other ones. So this is five volts here, and that's fine. This is the uh, 3.3 volts, it's fine. And the 12 volts on the ATX connector is fine. So that's all fine. I can't easily see how I can measure the V core voltage here. It looks like the VRM, the MOSFETs are actually underneath here, which makes it awkward to get at. Let me see, can I unscrew that? No, it's like sort of soldered in place basically. So that's not going to be so easy to do. I'll take the RAM out. Okay. We'll connect a. In fact, we already have a speaker on here, but if there's any speaker terminals, I will connect a speaker. I'll see where the power switch goes. Yeah, I can see where the speaker goes there over here. So I'll attach those and then let's see what it does. I've just attached a different speaker. One of the wires had fell off the other one, so we'll use that one. I think we're ready. So power up, power on. No CMOS battery fitted at the moment, by the way, but let's just try it. So power on, start. And it powers up. Okay. And, and it's bleeping. To say no RAM. Okay. Let's put some RAM in it. Now it looks like, yeah, this takes two different sorts of RAM, so it's not like them one and three, well it is one, two, three, four, but if you look, these two I think are a different sort. Yeah, it doesn't fit in. Okay, so RAM in here. Okay. We're in. Let's try again. I'll also connect a monitor as soon as this has on board VGA. Right, we're ready to go. Start. Okay, so this seems to think it has no RAM. Yeah. So that's where the problem is with it. Let's have a quick look while it's powered up, just to see if I have any voltage supply to the RAM. So it looks like the RAM of VRM is here at the front of the motherboard. Down here, probably. Ground. Let's see. No voltage there. Okay, nothing there. Ah, here we go, 3.29. Nothing there. So this looks like it's not running. I can check on the capacitors down here. It's really getting warm. No, I don't think so. 3.2. 3.2. I'm not sure what the RAM voltage actually is on this type of RAM. I need to have a look. Yeah, nothing hot. Look at these capacitors near to the RAM. Nothing. 3.3. Nothing. Okay. I'd have to go and look up what the correct voltage is. However, this RAM's a bit sticky. I don't like it much. Nothing hot here. Yeah, there's a little bit of warm paint, but nothing. I don't think it's overly hot. Let's clean these first before we go down a rabbit hole, yeah? Just a bit of isopropyl. This I think is DDR400. I haven't looked. It's not PC133. 
because that has two notches. It could be there's some jumper settings on this that select between the two types of RAM. I would have to find the user manual and have a look. Yeah, this is PC133. As you can see, there's like two, two key notches in there. Right. We can try both types. And this, I think, will find as DDR400. Okay. While well, it's just evaporating, let's clean the DM strips themselves. We could use a, a, a razor rubber on a pencil, but since I have this to hand, it works pretty well also. Okay. Just reseat them a few times. Okay. Let's try that. We'll try with both. We can also try with one, and we can also try the other type of wrap. Let's see what we get. Continuous bleeping. Yeah. Just go with one. Same thing. Go with just the other one. Then we'll try PC133. Okay, no difference. Get some PC133. Okay, I have some of this as well. I'm pretty sure these green ones work. So as I say, these have the two notches. Okay. Try with two of them. Okay. What happens? What do you think, guys? What do you think will happen? Well, the blue light came on the monitor, but no picture. And it's bleeping really to say no RAM. Okay. So changing that didn't help. It's just one strip. Just the other strip. Okay. Let's have a look at a few things. First of all, where is the RAM going to? Is it the CPU or is it this chip? Let's have a look. Well, I'm fairly confident you can see that the tracks from the RAM do indeed go to this chip. Okay, so this is the memory controller, not built into the CPU. So we can tell that just by looking which way the tracks go, okay? So this is the memory controller. So this could have some problem or a voltage supply problem. The next thing I need to do is have a look on the internet to see what supply voltage I would expect on PC133 and on DDR400. Let me have a look. Google tells me that the DDR400 actually has a 2.5 volt supply and the PC133 seems to be either 2.5 or 3.3 i found different places that told me different things so it's quite possible the whole thing runs on 2.5 on the ram which means we would expect to find a 2.5 volt supply here somewhere and that's what i've not found so far so let's have a good look now and see if we can actually find that 
I did find the user manual. So this is a not the manual he sent with it. This is a KM2M combo, and I did find it. There's no jumpers that set the RAM speed or the RAM type, but there is this one, which it doesn't tell you in the manual what it actually is, but it does show it in that position. So I think we'll have to live with that. We'll put a CMOS battery on now as well while we're at it. Let's start it up again then and let's see if we can find this 2.5 volt supply. Well, there's certainly nothing around these MOSFETs. There's... This one appears to have nothing on any of the pins. Okay, and this one appears to have 3.3 volt coming in, but nothing going out. But there's no coil around here, inductors. It's not a book regulator because I can't see the coil. This one also has 3.2 coming in, 3.2 going out. 9.8 volts coming in. Okay, 9.8, 3.2, 3.2. That's actually getting quite hot. No, so it must be supplying basically no current. Some more up here. That's a 5 volt rail. That's a 0.8. This might be for the CPU. Okay, and there's another little one next to it. 9.8. What's this 9.8 coming from? Have we got 9.8 on our 12? No, we've got 12. So where's that 9.8 coming from? It's a bit strange. We have a voltage defined, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not totally sure exactly where that comes from. Let's have a look for some shorts around here. Okay, sorry about the bleeping. Probably I should have unplugged that. <laughs> Let's have a look for any short circuits. So, what can we see? Especially around the points where there's no pin. Ah, oh, okay. Well, one end would go to ground, you would expect anyway. Is this one connected to this one? In some way, like that to that, for instance. Yeah, so this is like power in by the looks of it. That connects to that, and this is ground. This is wide a bit like a book converter, but with no coil that I can see. But the fact I have a connection to ground doesn't particularly interest me or worry me. Okay. Where's that other one up here? Okay. All I can really say is this one appears to have no voltage. There's a couple of what might be Zener diodes down there. Is that like We'll do it with a short. What's it look like in diode mode? Nothing that way. Should read this way. Diode junction. Diode junction. Okay. And these capacitors down here are probably ones that he's changed. Yeah, these have been sold. Let's have a look for shorts here as well. Okay, so that's these. Let's have a quick look. Just normal resistance mode, continuity. No short. Nothing short there. Or there. Okay. I'm a bit puzzled at the moment by this circuit with the three capacitors down here. No inductor, looks like a book regulator, but it isn't. 
and I haven't found this 2.5 volt supply. There's another one here, we can check that one. Yeah, let's look at that one. Okay, start. I won't pull this this time for you. Okay, that's quiet now, we just one speaker uh, on this one. 3.1, 1 1.5, 3.2. Okay, guys. There's a couple of ways we can go with this now. Um, firstly, I'm going to see if I actually have a schematic for this board. I have quite a lot of MSI schematics, so I might be in luck. If I don't, then I think we'll use the thermal camera and see if that shows anything. Okay, I'm in luck this time. I do have the schematic. So this is the MS6738 version 1.0. I have the schematic for this motherboard. I will link it in the description to this video. And I found the relevant section that we're interested in, which is basically this part. So this chip U17 is involved with generating quite a lot of voltages. This is the AC PI controllers and regulators. So this basically generates a lot of the voltage rails on the motherboard. You'll see things here like uh, VAGP, AGP drive. So surely this is the AGP slot. You will see various inputs coming in, PCI reset, for example. You'll see things going out, such as CPU reset power guard various power good standby i think so this and we can see the sleep states here as well this chip is involved with powering the various sections of the motherboard the ones i'm interested are here so we have vram drive 2 vram drive 1 which powers these two mosfets and then we have VRAM 2.5 DEN and VRAM 2.5 Drive. So as I can understand it, oh, and I can see this now, DRAM Select, okay. So the DRAM Select will choose between the two different types of RAM this motherboard accepts, either DDR or PC133, and they have different supply voltages. So the DRAM Select will come in here, and this must be active if you have the DDR inserted and it will switch on this voltage supply. So we see we have 5 volt dual coming in. This will be a 5 volt rail from the ATX most likely via something. And then we have the output here, VCCM. This is the power to the memory. If this isn't selected, I'm assuming because there isn't a particular select, it defaults to using the PC133 and it drives these two MOSFETs which will generate this supply VCC3 and that must go to the SD RAM. I have the DDR inserted at the moment but I have actually tried both, neither of them will detect. But if we look at this voltage VCCM and we just search, see where it goes to, it goes to the north bridge, yeah. Northbridge 2 or 3 memory. So we know it powers the memory controller in the Northbridge. Let's have a look a bit further. Okay, these are the DIM slots. Yeah, the actual memory slots. You know, DDR SD RAM DIM, DDR SD RAM. So these are the slots. Yeah, and you can see that VCCM also comes to these slots. So we know. That is the voltage that we're interested in to power the RAM. This chip also generates another voltage, which we can see here. So this is this BT drive and BT sense, and that generates this voltage DDR VTT, which clearly goes to the RAM. So I'm interested to see what's happening with this voltage. This is Q33, Q35. I'm interested to see what's happening with this voltage. 
This is Q39. I don't have this RAM in search at the moment, so I'm not so interested in this one. Let's have a look around here. So Q39 and Q3334. Here is Q39 down by the processor, the largest one. So that's the one that generates the 2.5 volt supply to the RAM. Let's have a look what we can see on this one. So we have 2.6 volts coming out. That actually seems like it's working. 5 volts going in. 5 volts there. So that actually works basically like it's correct, 2.5. What's going on with the other one, VTT? So we have 0 0.79, 0 0.78. 0.79 yeah we seem to have a problem with this supply so that one seems to be okay but this one isn't let's just see where that goes so this one will come from this chip somewhere let's find the pins i want to make sure i have a connection from the gates so from the uh, gate here should go to the chip just put on two Continuity mode. Oh. Well, it does go to the chip. But it goes to at least two or three pins. How about this one? That's pin 10. So that one goes to pin 10 on the chip. This one, 12, 11, 10. I'm counting the clicks, nine. Seven, eight, and nine. Let's have a schematic again. Okay, so one of them goes to pin 10. Yeah, that's the drive to Q35. And the other one, well, it seems to go to seven, eight, and nine. It's a short here somewhere. I mean, the source goes to nine. That goes to eight, but seven goes elsewhere. That's just a signal coming in. Let's have a look at this MOSFET. This is Q33. Something's wrong, I think. Okay, so Q33 is this one. That reads okay. Let's go to diode mode. Oh, we've got a short, guys, from the gate to the source, I think that is, which connects to the drain of this one. Yeah, I think we've got a short circuit MOSFET here. It's, a, it's okay source to drain, but it reads short from the gate. Ah, oh. is there anything else on that circuit that could cause that rather than the MOSFET? So the short's here, from here to here. And there's nothing else connected here, just the chip. Okay. BT drive and BT sense. Those two are shorted. So it's looking like it's the MOSFET or the chip. I mean, there's no nothing else. There's no capacitors or anything on here. Yeah, those, but they don't go. They go elsewhere. I'll just check for shorts to ground from the drain, but I don't think because I'm sure I have VCC3. So it's looking like we've got a shorted MOSFET or a faulty chip. Okay, so to ground. No shorts. No shorts to ground. Yeah, there's no shorts. So it looks like we have a shorted MOSFET or the chip. The MOSFET's the easiest to remove, even though it's right next to this, which is going to make it a bit tricky. I'm going to have to remove these two capacitors, but I think because of where this is, and it's hard to get to, I'll be better if I can just lift, or I may have to cut, for example, the gate. And then we can see if the short has gone off, it's still there, yeah? And if it's still, if it's, we can see if it's on the MOSFET, basically, or not. Let's try that technique.
In fact, now I've zoomed out, I'm just having a good look to see if I can see any like solder bridge or anything that might be causing the problem. Because it's close to these capacitors that the guy has soldered. So I've got on the other side as well. Yeah, they're here. I mean, I don't see any solder bridge. There's no short on these capacitors, we can say for certain. There's no short circuit there. There. No short circuit there. So the capacitors are okay. They would have to short to an adjacent track. And they're not. What I don't know is... I would have to ask him, but now I've got it on the bench, I don't really have the time. I want to see if I can fix it, as whether this problem was there before he recapped it, which is why he recapped it, because that's what he thought the problem was. Because it doesn't look like bad workmanship here, to be quite honest. And if it did, one end of these capacitors is connected to ground. Okay, it's not shorting to ground. Let's go back to the MOSFET. And back to plan A. So this is the MOSFET where the short is. Okay? You can see it. That's the short. I'm going to try to lift this leg of the MOSFET from, away from the board to see whether it is the MOSFET short or whether it's something on the track, basically. Um, I'm going to turn this around make it easier for me to work on. Okay, coming from a more comfortable angle, which is this one. I could lift either leg, but I'm going to go for this one. Furthest from the capacitors. It's got a bit of a... Uh, flux on there. Bit of leaded solder, okay? Now let's see if I can actually lift this pin. I'll try solder braid first, but more than likely, I'll just have to get a blob of solder on there and then effectively lift it up with some little sharp implements, some tool to get under there. Okay, let's clean it off. Let me see what, what I can find to lift it with. We'll, we'll try this little hook shaped thing. Can get it under the MOSFET and then we'll try to lift it away from the board. It might snap off, but hopefully it won't. It might just not move all to, at all. No, yeah, proving difficult. Let's get a good blob of solder and try again. Otherwise, I'll cut the pin. I can always effectively solder it back again with a little bit of wire. Let's try to get under this. Ah. Okay, so it was a disaster because I broke the MOSFET. That's how not to do it, guys. Okay. Is the short gone? Yes, the short... Ha no, the short hasn't gone. So we're now in a worse situation than where we started. It looks like the short is in the chip. Uh, it's looking like the short must be in the chip then. I mean, getting a MOSFET isn't a problem. It's just one of them things, guys. It happens. P3055. I'm sure I can get some of those. But more worrying is where is the short if it's not the MOSFET. It's a shame that I broke off because I can't just prove the MOSFET was okay. Unless, ah, unless I can maybe just get into here. No. Well, actually, I'm making a contact on it, you can see. Uh -huh. Okay, we need a MOSFET. But the problem is, this chip, I don't think I can even get these. We're going to have to remove it and see if that's where the short is. So, easiest way. Add some forks, add solder to all the pins, hot air and lift it off the board. Okay. Just bridge them together. That's what we want to do. I 
I will take the CMOS battery out, by the way, while I just think about it. Should have thought about it slightly earlier, but there you go. Okay. I don't normally use Captain Tape. I find it makes it harder to in fact we get his into the board but in this case I'm going to try and use it to, to, to have some hopeful attempt at protecting the end of the memory slots to see if this capacitor has been changed no no sorry yeah that one's been changed as well so that isn't really short is it so have a look No, it looks like it, it's not actually bridging to the track or anything like that. Yeah, that looks okay to me. We can soon find out anyway if we measure from that end of the capacitors where the short is. Uh, oh, that'll prove it. So, that end of the capacitor. I'll just go to where the short is. No. That, that, that doesn't go to there. No, so that isn't the short. Okay. If I do this right, the wedded solder mixed with the unwedded should melt first and it should just lift off before anything else unsolders. Okay, and if I've done it wrong, well, we'll find out. It'll be awkward to pick this up. It slid a little bit, but it came off. While that's warm, I'll just get a bit of solder bread and clean that area up a little bit. Okay, that looks quite clean. So although it slipped, it didn't actually dislodge any other components. And that's because I hadn't got it hot enough for the lead free solder to melt. Some of you guys say use bismuth solder or chip quick. Uh, personally, I do have chip quick and we'll have a play with it on another video, but I think this method works very well and 60-40 leaded solder is cheap, yeah. So I don't think you actually need anything special, but we'll have a play with that in the future. Now, let's see if our short is still there after it's gone. And it has gone, yeah. Meter working. The short has gone. So, the fact I destroyed the MOSFET is a bit of a moot point because the problem is the chip. And I don't think I can get these apart from off a salvage board. Let's have a look what it is. Here's the chip I just desoldered, so we can just check this to make sure it does have a short and it wasn't a solder bridge or something like that on the board causing the problem. So, Having said that, the short has gone away, but 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. So this is pin 8, and it was going to 9. 12, 11, 10. Yeah. 12, 11, 10, 9. Oops, I slipped. But yeah, you can see the short was there. Okay, so that's where the short is on the chip itself. So we need to get a replacement one of these. I've had a look on AliExpress, I can't find these. I think the only chance of repairing this is to find a scrap board that has one on, which may be a possibility, but because of that problem, I do have another option for the owner of this. The other option is then, apart from waiting for parts, I have another board here. This is an Asus, but it takes the same processes 
In fact, it takes a wider range of processors than that MSI board. It's very similar in a way. It is also different. So it's a full size ATX. It has three RAM slots. It only takes the DDR400, not PC133. And it doesn't have onboard video. But other than that, it's basically the same CPU support. In fact, it's a wider support. This is a full size ATX. I don't know what type of cabinet that other motherboard came out of. And I don't know if it was being used with an AGP card. I'm probably guessing it would be. So there's a possibility for the owner if you just want something else. I'm going over to the UK probably every month or so now. So I could either post from here, I could send you your board back if you like. Or I could sort of take both over to the UK and post them from there, save a bit of money, if you don't mind waiting a little bit. The final thing, of course, is that I offer a no-fix, no-fee service. So I couldn't fix it, no fee. If you want it back, just pay the postage. And to everybody else, I hope you enjoyed that video. I thought that was really an interesting repair attempt. I do believe I would have had that one working if I had the correct replacement part. That short was only between the MOSFET and that chip. It didn't go to anywhere else. So I doubt anything else would be affected. I'm pretty sure that it would have worked if I had the right parts to fit. So on that note, I will leave you with that. I look forward to your comments below and I will see you all soon on another Learn Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now, guys.